verses 22 through 23. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I'm glad to see each of you here tonight. I hope you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you have them open there. To Romans chapter 14. This was a topic that was asked of me just a couple of weeks ago to address. and So I put some material together, and I hope that it is helpful to you. Hope you had a good day, and uh, hope that you are ready to study here tonight. What about the Christian and holidays? So I've got in my office, I've got one of those big paper desk calendars, you know, monthly. And I don't know if I'm exaggerating here, but I'll just go ahead and exaggerate. It's like every day of the year is now a, set, a cer certain day, isn't it? Uh, I never had heard, and I don't know how old this is, how long it's been around, National Bosses Day. Did you guys know that was a thing? No? I've never been a boss, so why would I know? But uh, Claudia started, she would have me a little something every National Bosses Day. First time she did it, I said, what are you talking about? And she explained to me, this is a day. And now you've got, what, National Sons Day, National Daughters Day. It's like every day is some kind of day. Some kind of, and it may not be a federal holiday where you get off of work, but I, in my personal opinion, it may be the kind of inclusion idea that every, everything has to be celebrated. Everybody has to be made to feel special, kind of catering. Everybody gets a trophy kind of mentality, but whatever the case may be. There are a few holidays that people struggle with. And I've preached in, in a little over 25 years with four different congregations in three different states. And I've run into all kinds of different beliefs that Christians have in regard to holidays and even down to birthdays. I have known Christians who felt that, that Christians shouldn't even celebrate birthdays. And their logic behind that was, well, the only people we read about in the Bible celebrating birthdays were people like Herod. Well, Job's children celebrated their days too. So I think some of these sentiments that people have are very personal. And that's kind of the direction I want to go tonight in terms of the Christian and holidays. Where should we stand? What should we do? I, well, let me, let me just get started with this. So I pulled the elders aside Wednesday night after services and talked to them because I have been working on this material for a couple of weeks because it was suggested or I guess it was asked of me to do a lesson on this. And I'll just tell you guys, I went all kinds of different directions, looking at different approaches. I got into looking at things like, what are, the, what are the origins of these holidays? And are they paganistic? What's the Christmas tree mean? And the Easter bunny? And I left all that behind because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's, again, there's a lot of ignorance about all of that. Some of you may not even know some of the things to which I refer when I say those things about in terms of origins of holidays and practices that we see. So I considered all these different approaches that I could take in terms of this. And what we're going to do tonight is the conclusion that I came to. And like I said, I talked to my elders and asked them their advice. How should I do this? And I told them what I was working with and my, what I was thinking about, and they helped me. And I, I appreciated that. So I want to share four principles with you and then we'll get to Romans 14. Number one, we have no right to make laws where God has not. If God has not specifically legislated on a thing, then you and I cannot legislate and make a thing a law. So Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 18, verse 18, whatever you bind on earth will already have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will already have been loosed in heaven. So we understand the hierarchy of authority. It all starts with God, doesn't it? The apostles were sent out. They were commissioned in what they were going to do, what they were going to preach and teach by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That stuff was already bound in heaven or already loosed in heaven. You and I have no right to make laws where God has not. That's principle number one that we need to understand. Principle number two. We are going to discuss matters tonight that are matters of liberty and personal judgment. This is on an individual level. Okay, We're not talking about congregational issues here. These, these are personal 
private, if you want to use that term, matters of liberty and judgment. Liberty, freedom. We have some freedoms in Christ. Now, it's also true that we have laws in Christ, don't we? We are under law to Christ, 1 Corinthians 9, 21. But in that, we also have freedom. You'll see that as we read Romans 14. Number three, in these, in these matters of liberty, our attitude and treatment of one another, that's the issue at hand. That's the issue at hand, how we deal with one another. Some people think that their opinions or judgments or scruples, Paul uses that word, if you use a New King James Version, he has it in Romans chapter 15 and verse 1, that we ought to bear the strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. Some people feel that their scruples are law and should be bound. Everybody should believe the way I believe on this. That's kind of the mentality that some people have. Well, no, you are not the standard of righteousness. You're not the standard by which every person conducts himself in terms of their liberty and personal judgment. That's kind of like, you know, get over yourself. Who do you think you are to, to feel that way? It's how we treat one another in these matters of liberty and personal judgment. Number four, these are issues that are neither right nor wrong by themselves. Now, again, the Bible lays out for us right and wrong. And, you know, quick instance, the, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. There are obvious right and wrong issues and the Bible obviously delineates, delineates those very clearly. But what we're going to talk about tonight are issues that are neither right nor wrong by themselves. Now, they can become wrong because of that third principle. Our attitude and treatment of one another is the issue at hand. So here's what we're going to do. I told you I, I told you what I was doing. I was looking at all this different material and doing a lot of reading on origins and intentions in the beginning of, of holidays, and, and I, I left all that stuff behind. What we're going to do tonight is read Romans 14, and I want you to listen to the words. There, again, there are laws in Christ. There are laws in the New Testament. There's no question about that, but there are also matters of liberty and personal judgment. So I want you to listen to what Paul says here. I'll have a few comments as we go through this, but in general, we're going to be reading him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. This, the weak versus the strong, has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with how long a person has been a Christian. This is a, these, all of these issues that we're going to be reading about and what we're talking about tonight are matters of personal conscience. You may have a person who's been a Christian for 50 years, who maybe they have a scruple, they have a strong opinion on the celebration or non-celebration of holidays. It has nothing to do with their Christianity and their knowledge of the Bible necessarily or anything like that. We're talking about matters of judgment and conscience. But notice the last part of that verse. The King James says, but not to doubtful disputations. The New King James says, not to disputes over doubtful things. I like that. That wording is just more clear. You don't argue over these things that maybe you personally have a doubt. Maybe you personally are concerned about it. Leave it alone. And we'll get there as we read. You'll see that. You'll see Paul saying that. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let him that eateth, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Whatever Paul's essentially saying, whatever your opinion is on these matters of eating, whether you're going to eat meat or not, refrain from it, leave each other alone. And, and certainly, notice that word there in verse 3, despise means to, to treat with scorn. They don't do what you do, and so you look down on them, and, and maybe you even mock them in a way, oh, I can't believe, that's silly. I'm doing it. Why wouldn't you? Do? Don't do that. Don't despise the one who doesn't agree with you on these matters of doubtful things. Don't make scornful comments. Don't condemn them. Don't try to get them on your side. Leave them alone. And it goes in both directions. And here it is. Verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? 
To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be held up, for God is able to make him stand. See, that's the issue. These are issues that, just use myself, that I may have that God knows about. Now, again, not anything in regard to law in the New Testament, things that are required of Christians, nothing like that. But these are maybe some questions or doubts that I have in my mind. Well, God is able to make me stand. Whatever position I take on holidays, that's between me and God. It's not between me and you. And so you can't force your opinion on me on that, and I can't force my opinion on you. One man, and so here we go, look at verse 5. One man esteems one day above another. So put that phrase, Romans 14, 5, in the context of 21st century America and Christianity. What are the three biggest days of church attendance? Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day. In fact, Mother's Day, I think, is bigger than both of the others. Well, one man esteems one day above another. You know, we may have visitors in our crowd on a day like that, Christmas or Easter. How do we handle that situation? Do we blast them because they're at church on December 25th or whatever day it is in April? It's the one opportunity that we may have to have an influence on them. And we're going to use that to shame them for maybe holding that day in a little higher esteem than they do every other day of the year. What does Paul say about that? One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. So in my opinion, this is one of the main keys in Romans 14. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. It's not my business. If you were to feel that December 25th is the most important day of the year, not my business. And it's not your business if I don't feel that way. Let every man be fully convinced in his own mind. And I'm just using that date because that's, that's prominent in our culture. Okay. He that regardeth the day. Here's his point. He that holds that day in a special place. He does that to the Lord. That's in his mind. That's his conscience. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord. He doth not regard it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives thanks. And he who does not eat. To the Lord eats not and gives God thanks. They're both thankful to God for what they have. Maybe they just have some dietary agree, uh, disagreements. And of course, first century Christianity, the context would be buying meat, that part of that meat had been offered to idols. Some Christians couldn't do that because of their conscience. What's Paul say? Leave them alone. Let each of you be fully convinced in your own mind. For none of us liveth to himself and none dieth to himself. No man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Regardless of your position on these issues, if you're in Christ, you're the Lord's. Leave each other alone in these matters of judgment. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be both Lord of the dead and the living. And here it is again. But why do you judge your brother? And contextually, in these matters of things that we could argue over if we so chose. Why do you judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set thy brother at naught? That's that word again that means to scorn, to mock him. Why do you do that? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow. And I want you to, if you mark in your Bible, I want you to underline these words. If You, you don't have to, but I did this. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow. I underline these words, to me. You don't bow to me. And I don't bow to you. And if we have matters of conscience, matters of, you know, issues of conscience with certain things, you are not my judge and I am not your judge. But we're all going to bow to God, aren't we? Verse 12, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us, there, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And again, that just gets back to the principle of leave each other alone in matters of dispute or in matters of doubt, in matters of conscience. Don't cause each other to stumble over these issues. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself. Well, that what's he talking about in context? Meat or no meat? 
observing days or not observing days. That's what he's talking about. Those things by themselves, and that was one of the principles that I put up here on the screen, um, these issues that are these are issues that are neither right nor wrong by themselves. That's what Paul's saying here in verse 14. There's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. It may not be unclean to me, but if it is to you, it is. And that's not my business. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not uncharitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Jesus died for the person who maybe views a certain day of the year as more important than any other day of the year. He died for that person just as much as he died for the one that looks at every day as if it were the same. There's no difference in what Jesus did for us. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Do things the way you feel you need to do it. And if it doesn't bother your conscience, okay. Don't let your good, that which you feel that you can do in freedom, don't let it become evil. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteous. It's not about these physical things in the sense of matters of conscience, but it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore... Here, so how do we conduct ourselves in these difficult scenarios? Let us, verse 19, therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. I think the work of God there, I think he's talking about the church because he's talking about issues in the church at Corinth, uh, the, the church at Rome, I'm sorry. Don't disturb the body of Christ because you have an opinion on something. Because you do or do not have a scruple on a certain issue. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eats with offense. If it bothers your conscience, don't do it, whatever it is. But don't judge anybody else for not doing it. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. It's kind of the, and this goes back to the larger context, looking back to verse 3, not despising, not judging. Verse 10, why do you judge your brother? Why do you set him at naught? Connect those verses with the thought in verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Don't try to bring people to your side in matters of opinion, because you're going to cause them to sin. You're going to hurt their conscience. And if you violate your conscience, you've sinned. And if you cause somebody else to violate their conscience by your bad behavior and your judgmentalism, you've sinned. Now, this gets to our scripture reading. And I've told you this before. Look at verse 22. The King James says, Hast thou faith? So the word faith comes from the Greek word, it's a uh, pistuo, and it means, it, it means a variety of things. To have trust, to believe in something, to have faith, as it's translated here. But one of the definitions is about conviction. And I've told you that before. So let's read it that way. Do you have a conviction about something? The reason I'm reading it that way is because of what verse 5 says. Let each man be fully persuaded. I think the New King James says convinced in his own mind. So let's read Romans 14, 22 that way. Are you convinced about something? Are you convicted about something? Have it to thyself before God. Keep it, to your, keep it between you and God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he allows. And he that doubts is damned if he eats, because he eats not out of faith. For whatsoever is not out of faith is sin. If you violate your conscience, maybe to fit in with somebody, or if you force somebody to violate their conscience, maybe to fit in with somebody, what does Paul say? If it's not out of a conviction, if you're not fully convinced, verse 5, in your own mind about what you're doing, you've sinned. And you can cause other people to sin in that same way. Now, this is one of those instances where the chapter and verse breakups don't help us any. Because look at chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And like I said, if you're looking at the New King James, it does better here. We ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. 
That's what he's talking about. These things which there is doubt over, which your conscience may struggle with from time to time, and that can look... There are a lot of things that could fall under this umbrella of scruples and personal judgment. But I was asked specifically about holidays. So be thinking about that. We then that are strong ought to bear with the infirmities of the weak. And look at this last phrase in verse 1. And not to please ourselves. See, that's what most people are worried about. Self-preservation and bringing people, onto their own, bringing people over to their side. I want you to see it my way. There are some things it doesn't matter. I'll just leave you alone. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. But our culture tells us that, no, I, I want to please me. I'm the one that I need to be worried about, not you. Okay, so, I don't know if I'm going to get myself in trouble here or not. <laughs> I, might get, I might be getting Gail in trouble here is what I might be doing. I'm going to tell a little story. Illustrate what I'm trying to say. She bought me a t-shirt, and it's an it's a outline of the United States of America, and it's a flag. It's painted as a flag, and there are little guns all in that little flag. And it says, how, how does it say? My, my rights do not end where your feelings begin. You know, that's a very, you know, gun control, that's a very hot issue in our country. And I'll tell you guys, that's an issue that would fall under scruples. But listen to that statement. My rights don't end where your feelings begin. Guess what? In Christ they do. In the church they do. My rights end where your feelings begin. That's verse 2 here. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Why? Why would I do that? Because Christ didn't even please himself. Verse 3. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. That's a quote from the Old Testament. You know, so we hear preaching from the Old Testament. What do we always hear? Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. We need to know the Old Testament. Well, that's a quote. I think it's Psalm 69 and verse 9. But Paul's talking about a very specific thing there. Christ did not please himself. And that's the whole lesson. And whatsoever things were written aforetime, which would now for us include the Gospels, the New Testament, are written for our learning. Now the God of patience... I, Paul's not writing by accident here. So he's talked about accepting one another and not violating one another's consciences and not forcing your opinion on other people. And then notice what he says here in Romans 15, 5. Now the God of patience and consolation. Maybe he's trying to tell us that we need to be people of patience and consolation. That we will bear with one another. You heard me talk about that in the series throughout, Romans, uh, throughout 1 Corinthians 13, didn't you? Bear with one another. Be long-suffering with one another. God is a God of patience and consolation. You know what? Not everybody's going to agree with me on every little issue in life whether it's the holidays, whether it's gun control, whatever you want to name, not everybody's going to agree with me. And you know what? That's okay. And not everybody's going to agree with you on those issues of scruple. And that's okay because you are not God. And I am not God. We are not each other's judges in those things. Grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ. Why? Why would we try to do this? What, I tell you what, why not be more American? More my rights, your ideas are stupid, you need to, you know, you need to get more educated, you need to listen to me and, and, and take on my opinion, my take on things, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, here's what you do, guys. Receive you one another. You don't divide. You don't split the church because you have an opinion about something. And you're trying to go around and force it on everybody else. Or you think somebody's opinion on something or their, their freedom to do or practice something that you disagree with is bad. And so you'll go talk to somebody else about it. No. 
you have it to yourself before God, Romans 14, 22, and you receive one another, Romans 15, 7, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. I think one of the big things to help us, you know, kind of step back and think of this whole subject is the makeup of the church at Rome. The makeup of the church at Rome was a pretty close mix of both Jews and Gentiles, and they come from extremely different backgrounds, don't they? And like I said, there is law in Christ. There are things over which we cannot disagree. There's no question about that. But there are a lot of things culturally, and we even encounter that in our country. So like I said, I've preached in four different states. Is that right? Three different states, four different congregations over 25 years. And I've run into people who, Christians, who believe that it's sinful to celebrate birthdays. Christians who believe that any acknowledgement of the birth of Jesus in December is like a curse. You will go to hell if you talk about the birth of Jesus in December. And I'll, I'll just tell you my personal opinion on it. And again, I talked with the elders about this on Wednesday night. Here's my personal opinion on why that's the case. It is the case that the denominational world emphasizes these things, isn't it? Certain national holidays, and they incorporate it in their worship service. And so, as the Lord's church, we see that, and our thing is... We need to be so different that we don't look anything like that. One, I heard one preacher illustrate it this way. This denominational group, they use the front door on their building, so the Church of Christ can only use the back door because we don't want to look like them. One, I heard one preacher say, we've become so distinct that we've become deformed. Well, I think there's something to that. We need to be very careful on how we handle these matters of scruple, Liberty and personal judgment. And the way to handle it is, leave everybody alone. Don't judge them. Don't scorn them. Don't mock them and try to win them over to your side. Because if they feel a way about it, then that's how they feel about it. So what are our conclusions from Romans 14? I've got three. in term And again, so our overall discussion today, the specific question to me was in regard to holidays. I've got three conclusions that I want you to think about. Number one, don't lie. You guys know what the, uh, the Cadbury cream eggs are? I love those things. But I know good and well an Easter bunny didn't lay those things, okay? I don't care what the commercials say. Don't lie. And there's a balance to find, I think, with your children. But don't lie to them. Conclusion number two, mind your own business. And that's, that's Romans 14 and 15. Mind your business. And then conclusion number three, God has specified one day for His children to honor and worship Him specifically, hasn't He? That's the Lord's day. That's the first day of the week. That's the day upon which Jesus rose from the dead. That is the day upon which uh, the church was established in Acts chapter 2. You have all those significant events. That's the day that the, that the first century church, the apostolic church, met to break the bread, and to worship together. There's one day that God has specified, and guess what? We can't disagree over that. We can't change our days of service. You know, there, there was a movement back several years ago that some denominational bodies were moving their services to Sunday night. I'm sorry, to Saturday night. And I don't even remember reading an article. I, can't, I think it was maybe in the Christian Chronicle. I don't remember exactly, but that some congregations were moving it to Saturday night, but on Sundays they offered a drive through Lord's Supper service. <laughs> Did you hear that? A drive through Lord's Supper service. So, the point being, God has specified one day for His children to honor and worship Him, and that is every first day of the week. Can't disagree on that. We may have some disagreements on some holidays and some other, I would say, cultural Issues like that. So go back to number two for that one. Mind your own business. Leave it alone. Do things the way Scripture lays out for us. Follow the law of God. Do what God says. But Romans fifteen seven, Receive you one another, even though you have these matters of, as Paul says in Romans 14, 1, disputes over things that are doubtful. Disputes over matters of conscience and liberty and personal judgment. Those are my conclusions, and that's it. Behave the way Christ behaved. That's, that's ultimately what it's, what's laid out here in Romans 15.3. Let's please one another, Romans 
Because that's what Jesus did for every one of us. That's the model that we follow. Well, it may be here that you are, maybe that there's someone here tonight who has never obeyed the gospel. Maybe this lesson was completely foreign. Maybe you've never heard anything like this. Now listen, I, I want to say this too. We hear a lot of preaching, and myself, you guys have over the years, five acts of worship, five steps of salvation, you know, these, what we call the fundamentals of the faith, we need to hear that stuff. But I think, we've, I think in the church a lot of times we hear all of that stuff exceedingly, and we don't hear enough of things like we've talked about tonight, Romans 14. There, it, so you've got Romans 14, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You've got four New Testament chapters that deal with all of this. And so to neglect that subject to the, to the overemphasis of other things is not a good thing. We need to have balance. Whatever the case may be, if you are here tonight and you need to obey the gospel, you need to become a Christian by putting Jesus on in baptism, by, putting, uh, by becoming a member of the Lord's body, by being baptized into Christ for the mission of sins, we want to help you in that. Maybe you have more questions about what, what all is involved in that, and, and I would say what takes place after that. We're here to do whatever we can to help you. And there's no room for disagreement on the plan of salvation, by the way. That's not a matter of conscience or judgment. Maybe you're here tonight as a child of God who has sin in your life. Repent of it. Change. Maybe what we've talked about tonight kind of, as we say sometimes, stepped on your toes. Well, change. Repent. But if there's anything that we can do for you in a public way, why don't you let us know right now as we stand and sing.